I was at the airport that I, like, actually realized that I was going. And I was like, holy hell, like, my life's about to change. Like, I'm really about to live in Japan for three months. For whenever you're listening to the Joshi Pod, your weekly podcast about the world of Japanese women's wrestling, Joshi Wrestling. I'm your host, Eric Howard, coming to you from beautiful San Diego, California, where it's been raining the last few days. We had a beautiful rainbow out today. Pretty spoiled out here in San Diego when it rains. It's actually news. Uh, I hope the weather is pleasant wherever you're listening. If not, let's hope this podcast can warm your hearts just a little. I first off want to thank you all for the positive feedback we got from last week's episode featuring the, the emotional interview from the fallen flower Kikio. If you haven't heard it yet, please go back and listen to it. Kikio shared so much with us. I really can't thank her enough for uh, for opening up like she did. I would like you to support the podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow the podcast on at the Joshi Pod on Twitter. I am giving away stickers out to anybody who subscribes, rates, and reviews the podcast. Send me a screenshot on Twitter at the Joshi Pod. I will DM you to get your address, and we'll send you out a Joshi Pod sticker. I'll need to uh, need you to follow me on Twitter so I can message you. Uh, positive ratings and reviews are a plus. Uh, stickers will start mailing the first week of December. We have some real fun interviews coming up. I don't want to jinx anything quite yet, but all your Joshi friends are going to want to hear them. Heck, your non-wrestling fans are going to want to hear them too. Uh, these are real-life stories from real people who are experiencing uh, the highs and lows in their, their lives. Uh, they just happen to be uh, Japanese women's wrestlers. On the show this week, we have the top five headlines of the week. Well, our show of the week is the Stardom Show from November 15th at Nagoya Legend Hall. It featured the finals of uh, Stardom's 2019 Tag League. Uh, we'll also highlight some of the big shows in the upcoming week in Japan, We'll also see where the Joshi performers are performing outside of Japan. And in the main event, we are joined by Hyan, who earlier this year completed her first tour of Japan. It's a real fun chat. She's uh, she's wonderful. You're going to want to stick around and listen to that. First, our top five headlines of the week are brought to you by one of our show sponsors, Quiet White Designs. The Ace, Nolan Ryan can help you design a uh, logo, a, a t-shirt, a sticker, anything anything you have you can imagine, he can design it for you. They've done great work for several wrestlers and promotions. Uh, uh, he's currently working on the Joshi Pod logo right now for a t-shirt that should be available in early 2020. Did I say t-shirt? That means t-shirt contest. Stay subscribed. Uh, some of their designs are also available on Redbubble. You can uh, reach out to them on Facebook by searching Quiet Wyatt, Q-U-I-E-T-W-Y-A-T-T, one word, designs. You'll get great quality work and great service when you tag team up with Quiet Wyatt Designs. Headline number one, the cutest WrestleCon in the world, the home of Maki Ito, Tokyo Joshi Pro Wrestling, announced this week that they'll have a show at WrestleCon during WrestleMania weekend next year in Tampa, Florida. The show will take place on Friday, April 3rd at the Ritz uh, Hotel. Uh, the Tokyo Joshi Pro talent will also be at the convention on Saturday, April 4th. Hopefully autographs and two shots galore. Uh, according to the Tokyo Joshi Pro's Twitter, uh, 12 to 14 wrestlers will be uh, flown over from Japan and will be selected to go to the U.S. Uh, the rest of the card will be filled out by foreigner, uh, foreign wrestlers. You would have to imagine Miyu Yamashita, Maki Ito, Yuka Sakazaki, Shoko Najima will for sure make the trip over. Hoping they bring my girl Rika over. Uh, who else would you guys like to see come over? Tweet me at the Joshi Pod. Headline number two, the pirate princess selling off to new lands. People listen to Dave Meltzer, but they don't always hear Dave Meltzer. The Kyrie saying Kyrie Hojo rumors won't seem to stop. I in the Wrestling Observer in an honest podcast, Meltzer just stated it was his opinion, not fact, that he thinks Kyrie may look for options outside of WWE when her contract is done. In my opinion, I agree with Dave Meltzer. If Kyrie's a smart businesswoman, she should look at other options outside of WWE. Everybody should look. There are three big things free agents need to be successful. One is talent. She definitely uh, checks the box there. Her talent is undeniable. Second is a healthy market. There's a lot of money out there in the wrestling world. There's always been a lot of money w with WWE, but now there's uh, the third thing that you need when you're a free agent, options. She has several options now. She can go back to Japan. She can stay in the U.S. with WWE. I'm sure AEW wouldn't say no to her either. Uh, when you have multiple suitors and the first two boxes are checked, you're in a really good spot, and, and Kyrie is in a really good spot. Start a bidding war. Get paid. Go back to Japan if that's what you want to do. I hope she makes a ton of money in the place that makes her the happiest.
Headline number three. She's not 40. She's four perfect tens. Happy birthday to arguably the best wrestler in the world. Not that Pro Wrestling Illustrated agrees. Uh, Miko Satamura. She's still competing at a really high level and shows no signs of slowing down. Uh, she still travels the world, torturing opponents wherever she goes. She's great. On the flip side, the biggest young little woman in Gato move, Rin Rin, turned 15. Happy birthday, Rin Rin. Headline number five. Pop Kan Mai to the Gato World Thailand branch. Tomorrow, November 23rd, will be the final show for the Gato Move Thailand branch. Pumi, who was the guest on episode two, please go back and listen. You're going to want to, it's, it's really good. He talks a lot about the, uh, the Thai branch. Uh, Amy Sakura, Say- Sayaka Obihiro, and many more put a lot of time and uh, effort into the Gato Move Thailand branch for the last seven years. Uh, again, if you want a history lesson, please uh, follow Pumi on Twitter at Pumi, P-U-M-I underscore G-T-M-V. Uh, it originally started as Bangkok Girls Pro Wrestling, and uh, the final match will be uh, for Thailand's most prestigious title, the one and only championship. Shivam, Paksa, Jonathan Johnson, and Emi Sakura are in a four-way match for the championship. Chok Di Na Pumi and the rest of the crew at the Gato Move Thailand branch. <laughs> The show of the week is the November 15th Stardom Show from Nagoya Legend Hall. It featured the finals of the Goddess Tag League. The show opened with a non-tag league match. Uh, Oedotai's Hazuki and Natsuko Tora defeated the returning Queen's Quest team of Leo Oenazaki and Utami Hayashishida. It was good to see Utami back and Leo back as well, but Oedotai got the best of them. The first match on the show from the Tag League, which didn't have any ramifications on the finals, uh, was Oedotai's uh, Session with Martina and Sumeri Natsu defeating Saya Yaida and Saya Kamitani. Martina and Natsu are the best. I desperately want Martina on this show. Session Moth, if you're listening, please be on my show. In another match, uh, tag league match that didn't have an impact on the final, but does impact some things uh, pretty pretty drastically here. Uh, the Tokyo Cyber Squad's Bobby Tyler and Zoe Lucas defeated Oedo Tai's Andres Miyagi and Kagetsu. There are some problems in Oedo Tai land. Uh, throughout the, the match, they were teasing dissension between Miyagi and Kagetsu, but each time they would stop just short of accidentally hitting each other. Uh, the finish happened when Kagetsu was holding Bobby Tyler and Miyagi was going to hit uh, Tyler with the Oedo Tai sign. Tyler moved, but Miyagi stopped just before hitting Kagetsu again. Just again, missing accidentally hitting her. Uh, Miyagi then, or Miyagi then just actually tried to hit Kagetsu on purpose with the sign, but she moved out of the way. The two argued, allowing Tyler to schoolboy Kagetsu for the pin. In the biggest undercard match, which the winner goes to the finals of the Tag League, uh, Arisa Hoshiki and Tam Nakano defeated Tokyo Cyber Squad's Death Yamasan and Death Hana. Uh, Tam hit the bridging tiger suplex and pinned Death Yamasan in just under six minutes again to win the block and make it to the finals. Their finals opponents who had already clinched B Priestley and Jamie Hayter finished out the red block by, by defeating Mayu Iwatani and Saki Kashima in about seven and a half minutes. In the final undercard match, uh, in a match that didn't have any effect on the tag league itself, but is going to have ramifications going forward, uh, AZM and Momo Watanabe defeated uh, Jungle Kiona and Konami, the tag champs. You've got to think that uh, with that win, AZM and Momo are going to get a uh, tag team title match uh, in the future. And in the finals of the tag league, uh, Risha Hoshiki and Tam Nakano beat B Priestley and Jamie Hayter. Uh, it was a good back and forth match. The uh, crowd really got into the final f- uh, finishing sequence. Uh, Nakano and Hoshiki hit a double knee and Hoshiki finished Hayter with a Brazilian kick to win the Goddess of Stardom Tag League 2019. Uh, Jungle Kion and Konami uh, came to the ring after the match and let them know who the best team really is. <laughs> The upcoming shows this week on November 22nd tonight, Seedling is at Shinkiba First Ring. All the Seedling regulars will be on the show. Tomorrow the 23rd is uh, Ice Ribbons uh, in Kanagawa, the Yokohama Radiant Hall. The ISX Championship is on the line with Mayo Yukihi versus Suzu Suzuki. It's uh, Yukihi's 30th championship defense. Also on the 23rd in the morning at Shinkiba First Ring, Tokyo Joshi Pro has a show. Shoko Nakajima returns from Mexico. The main match I want to discuss is the Rika Taksumi versus Saki match, which on Twitter, DDT Pro underscore ENG brilliantly explained. Uh, I've tried to follow the, the story on this through uh, Google Translate, but sometimes you lose things in translation. So his, uh, his explanation was awesome. 
So let me give you Cliff Notes version. Here's how this big grudge match came about. Uh, Hyper Misao, who was uh, Saki's first or Saki's current sidekick, uh, when she was Hyper Misao, she was a mask lovable loser. She was going to team with Rika because she couldn't beat her, so they can go after the tag team titles. That same very day where they decided to be tag team, Miyu Watanabe loses to Saki, and Saki keeps beating up Miyu after the match, and Rika makes the save. Hyper Masao comes out to help make the save too, but instead hits Rika with a chair. Masao cuts up her mask and joins Saki, but to join Saki, she has to give up everything from her past, including her mask and her friendship with Rika. Miyu Watanabe tries to get revenge against Saki, but can't beat her until she teams up with Rika, and they finally defeat Masao and Saki at Ultimate Party 2019. Masao starts to doubt Saki after that match, after that loss, but Saki beats some sense into Masao. Rika now wants to destroy Saki and free her friend and bring her bring back the old Masao. The only way to do that is to beat Saki in a singles match. I'm going to catch this one on the DDT's uh, streaming service. Stardom's also running Shinkibalan on the 23rd in the evening. Uh, Oedo Tai defends their uh, artist of Stardom six woman titles. Kagetsu, Sumeri Natsu, and Andres Miyagi face Momo, AZM, and Utami. Uh, I think it's bad news for Oedo Tai. I don't see how much longer Andres and Kagetsu can be a team. Also on this show is a really fun three-way match with Hazuki versus Hanakamura versus Riho. And finally, on the 23rd, the Wave has a show where Takumi Aroha is facing Yumi Oka. Uh, it's, Tumi, uh, it's Takumi's 14th championship defense. On the 24th, Oz Academy is in Aichi. Pierre J is back at the Kami Arena with Manami Katsu versus Raiden Hagane. Command Bolshoi is also on that card. Uh, Wave is in Shizuoka at the Fujisan Mess. Also on the 24th, uh, Stardom's on Shinkiba for the second consecutive night. The main event is the Goddess of Stardom Tag League match with the Tokyo Cyber Squad's Jungle Kiona and Konami facing the Tag League winners of Hoshiki and Nakano. Also on the card, uh, Stars takes on Oedo Tai. It's Mayu Itani, Saki Kashima, and Riho facing Kagetsu, Hazuki, and Sumeri Natsu. And finally on the 24th, Gato Move is back at it with Chris Brooks making his Ichikaya debut at Ichikaya Chocolate Square. We've got to catch that on YouTube for sure. Here's where some women will be performing outside of Japan. Uh, Miko's on the road again on November 30th and December 1st. Miko Satamura will be in uh, Seattle for Defy Wrestling at Wrestle Summit 2. On uh, November 30th, she's facing off with Nicole Savoy. Uh, her match for the first hasn't been announced yet. Uh, you can get tickets at DefyWrestling.com. On December 15th, Mika will be in Sheffield, England for Progress Wrestling, defending her Women's Championship. Her opponent's not known yet. Uh, I'll put a link on uh, the notes here where you can buy tickets for that show if you're in the UK. I keep telling you guys about the Chara Expo 2019 in Anaheim on December 7th and 8th. Uh, Tam Nakano and Mayu Itani are making a very rare California appearance. Please take advantage of this. You know, visit charaexpo-usa.com. Uh, if you're a fan of New Japan Wrestling, they're also going to be on there as well uh, under the whole Bushi Road uh, banner. Io Shirai will participate at NXT's TakeOver War Games at the Allstate Arena in Chicago on Saturday night. Uh, she was awesome in the uh, Mia Yim ladder match a couple weeks ago. She's, uh, she's amazing. Unfortunately, no Oscar or Kyrie at Survivor Series. Go figure. If anybody would like to share any information on upcoming shows, please uh, email the show at thejoshipod at gmail.com. The main event interview is sponsored by Level Up Pro Wrestling School. B-Boy, who has over 20 years of experience in the uh, wrestling industry with companies that include Ring of Honor, CZW, Pro Wrestling Gorilla, and so much more as the head trainer. If you're looking to get started or looking for some polish, contact Level Up Pro Wrestling. It's levelupschool.sd at gmail.com or call 619-825-7668. Before we get to that interview with Hyan, I want to remind you guys to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also follow me on Twitter at Eric San Diego and follow the show at The Joshi Pod. Please support all of our show sponsors. They help us make this uh, make this thing go. I'll put links in the show notes. Arigato gozaimasu. Our guest today debuted in 2014 for Booker T's Reality Wrestling in a battle royal. She had her first singles match in November of 2015, defeating Miranda. In 2016, she made her WWE debut facing Nia Jax on Monday Night Raw in Houston, Texas. On 2016 and 2017, she wrestled for many promotions in Texas, including Fire Pro, VIP Wrestling, Sabotage, and Metroplex Wrestling. And in 2017, she made her debut for both Rise and Shimmer 
Uh, in 2017, she also made her debut in Southern California, where she'll be appearing on November 30th, facing Viva Van at the Alternative Wrestling Show. Uh, she's been a regular on the Texas scene for working for many other promotions. And in April of this year, she made her first tour of Japan. This is where I'd like to bring into the show the current heart of Shimmer Champion, new Chicago resident, and queen of Texas, Hyam. Yes. <laughs> Welcome Hi. to the show, Hyam. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. All right. So, Japan. Tell me why it's important for for you personally and then for, I think, women in general, why it's important to go to Japan and wrestle. I think one reason that I decided to go to Japan was because um, just overall, it's just good to have that life experience to go somewhere you've never been before and just experience something new. I'm, like, really big on, like, adding color to your life, and I think, like, Going to Japan is definitely one of those things that will add color to your life and just make you a more well-rounded person. But um, in regards to wrestling, I think that, you know, there's so many different styles of wrestling. Um, You have, like, your, you know, just in the United States, you know, there's different kinds of styles. But internationally, there's um, different ways of approaching the sport. And so... Um, and I always feel like the more you know makes you a better and well-rounded performer. And so going to Japan was important to me because I, you know, wanted to learn more and just be a more knowledgeable and well-rounded performer. So do, do the women when you guys get together, do you guys talk about going to Japan? Is it like a dream you guys talk about or anything like that at all? Um, so for 2018... Um, every year I try to write down, like at the beginning of the year, I try to write down goals that I want to accomplish and going to Japan was like one of them. And so like at the end of each year, I try to reflect on my goals. I look back on the goals that I wrote down to see like how far I got or how close I got. So, um, in 2018, it was a goal of mine to go to Japan. So this year I got to go, um, and it was something that almost, like, I didn't think was possible, and I kind of just put it on the on the goal list because I just thought, like, you know, that would be cool. You know, even if I don't get there, it'd still be, like, you know, a great accomplishment. So um, it was kind of – it's always been a goal of mine, but I kind of didn't even think it was possible <laughs> for myself. Why is that? Um, I don't know. Like, it just kind of seems, like, so far away. Like, I mean, like, I know it, it literally is far away, but I don't know. It just seems like just a far-fetched goal to me. And I was like, I hopefully, you know, hopefully I get there, but I was kind of just reaching, putting it out there and hoping that I would get it. So it was kind of cool that it ended up happening. How did, okay, so how did the, it, it arise, or how did you make a connection to, to go to Japan? I had been contacted by um, Marvelous, um, which is Tsuga Nagayo's company in, in Japan. Um, and it was just so random. Um, I had met Nyla Rose, who uh, she had been over to um, Marvelous. And I had expressed like to her when I first met her, like, I thought it'd be cool to go over there. And then, you know, randomly I caught a message to go. And I messaged her and I was like, oh, my God. They messaged me and she was like, you need to go. You need to go. So what sacrifices did you have to make? I mean, making the commitment to go to, to Japan for the summer is a big deal. Yeah, I had to. There was a lot of sacrifices for sure. I had um, I had to quit my job and I had like a really nice paying like nine to five job in corporate America so I quit my job I didn't renew my lease or anything like that so I kind of just left everything behind and decided to go and so like when I came back I didn't have a job or like a place so my mom let me uh, stay with her for a few months so I figured my life back out all right. So, okay. So you're, you're, you're about to go on your flight to Japan. Tell me what you're feeling as you're about to board the plane to go to Japan. Um, 
I was like, dang, this is really happening. Because, like, I had known for um, like a couple months that I was going to go. Um, but it never really quite hit me. And it wasn't really, a, like, even the day before, it didn't hit me. Like, I had packed everything and nothing. It wasn't until, like, I was at the airport that I, like, actually realized that I was going. And I was like, holy hell. Like, my life's about to change. Like, I'm really about to live in Japan for three months. All right. That that part intrigues me the most about the day-to-day stuff there. So, okay, so you land in Japan. Who's there at the airport to greet you? Um, this girl, Rin, she um, is one of the wrestlers for Marvelous. So she picked me up from the airport and took me to the dojo. And then are you living at the dojo? Yes, I was living at the dojo. Um, well, it was kind of like the dojo was right next door. And there was like a little, like, the best way I can describe it is like a townhouse mm-hmm. uh, right next to the dojo. And then we would just walk over there in the morning to go train. Who's who's there with you at the townhouse, you know, you, you and who else? Suga Nagayo, she lives in the townhouse. Um, Takumi, uh, she was there as well. Um, all the girls in Marvelous except for Kaoru um, and another couple. There's one guy that's signed to Marvelous. He doesn't live in the, in the house, obviously, because it's a bunch of girls. But um, the older, more, like, veteran women don't live there. Um, but the young girls, the, the girls that are training, um, they're all, they all live in the dojo. So it's, like, probably, like, eight or nine girls that live there. And are they pretty open to you when you arrive? I mean, they, they welcome you pretty well? Yeah, they're, like... The culture there is amazing, and they're very welcoming. They're very, like, polite. Um, they're very understanding of the fact that, like, I didn't kind of know what was going on. So they would, like, you know, speak, say something in Japanese, and they would try to explain it to me in English. And then they would always, like, be like, do you understand? Do you understand? So they'd always check to make sure I understood everything that was going on. So that was always really nice. So we hear about stories about like dojo trainings and stuff. What was the dojo training like for you? Oh, it's in. It's literally so intense. So we w- I would wake up, um, and training would start at 10 a.m. So every morning at 10 a.m. Um, from 10 a.m. to 12:30, we would have conditioning. So we would run a mile and a half every single day. Like that's just how we would start. Um, we would do sprints up the stairs, we do sprints up a hill, then we would go to the dojo, we do a hundred push ups, a hundred sit ups, we do planks, uh side planks, just a lot of ad- abdominal work and then we would do like uh like hammer swings and stuff like that. And usually by the time we got to the hammer swings that was like the last thing that we did. Um, and then we would take, like, a two-hour break just to, like, uh, eat. And then at two, we would start the in-ring training. And then from there, we would, like, roll, um, practice our bumps, practice. Um, they're very big on, like, basic fundamental moves. So the young girls, they can only do, like, certain amount of moves until they graduate to other moves, but they have to make sure that the moves that they are, are allowed to do are perfect. So they practice, like, their drop kicks, their body slams, like, everything. They practice those things every day to make sure they are perfect. Now, were you physically prepared when you went over there for, for that type of intense training? Oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, the conditioning really wasn't too bad, like, the morning workout, I mean, it was hard. It was definitely hard and challenging, but it wasn't impossible. Uh, and the in-ring wasn't exactly hard either. It's just the the part that is difficult is the fact that you're doing it every single day and you're working out twice a day for, like, five hours total. And you're doing it, like, six days a week, and then you're, go- then you're going off and, you know, wrestling as well. So, like, you're doing shows. 
So, and then when you go to sleep, it's not like you have a nice little mattress that you sleep on. You sleep on a mat. <laughs> so it's just like, and the rings are harder as well. So it's like you're putting a lot of stress on your body, and the recovery, you know, is not great because you don't have time to recover and you're not sleeping on like a comfortable mattress. I took a whole bottle of Advil with me when I left and I, and it was completely gone by the time I got back. Like I had to use all of my Advil. A little sore every day, huh? Yes. So like the, the door, the, the townhouse life, what do you want to call it? Are you, is it a community like where you guys are like cooking meals with each other, or eating meals all together? Is that, is that what's kind of happening over there as well? Um, the younger, the, the new faces, they, um, they, uh, cook and clean every day. So I didn't have to cook, uh, per se. I mean, like, if I wanted to cook my own stuff, I could, but they kind of took charge of, like, lunch and dinner. So every, every night they would cook dinner and then all of us would get together and have, like, a big house dinner, um, every day. That sounds pretty cool, actually. Yeah, it was nice. All right. So, uh, you're training, you're training, you have your first match. So wh- first off, let me ask, where is the where is the townhouse at? Is that in Tokyo? Uh, it was in Funabashi, which is east of Tokyo. It's like maybe, uh, like, on train, maybe, like, 20, 30 minutes from okay. Tokyo. Okay. So yeah, like, first... it, w- you w- it would be almost like, like you would compare, like, a suburb to a big city. So, okay, so your first show is in Osaka, yes? Yeah. yeah. So is that a bus ride to Osaka or a train ride? How do you, how do you get to Osaka? It's a bus ride, but it's a really, really long bus ride. And side note, like, when I first got there, I don't know why. I got, like, I wouldn't say, like, it was food poisoning because it wasn't that intense. But, like, my stomach was definitely, like, upset to the point that I was, like, very, very nauseous. The whole bus ride, I was just miserable for, like, eight hours. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't know if I could do this show. But I was like, I have to, I have to, I have to. And your team was Dash Chisaka that night. Yeah. What was that like? Um, it was really cool because I had met Dash actually like two weeks before, or two, three weeks before because she was at Shimmer with Hiroya Matsumoto. So I met them at Shimmer and then they were at the Shimmer show in Mania weekend. So I had seen them like two weekends back to back. So I had already kind of like seen her work and had talked to her a little bit. Um, but then when I went to... Uh, Japan I actually teamed with her like I got to know her a lot better and I did a lot of shows with her um, and she's just like amazing she's like a sweetheart what's like the English like the, in the ring the language barrier when you're in the ring talking about Spock and things like that how does how does that work well after a while you kind of start to pick up on the terminology that they use for the move so like drop kick is drop kick so like you'll say drop kick and you're like okay that's a drop kick they'll say like brain buster and I'm thinking like oh you know like a brain buster but they actually mean like a suplex. And then to them, like a suplex is an arm drag. So, but actually like they do a lot of like lucha and um, a lot of the terms that they use are like lucha terms. So like in lucha, a suplex is an arm drag. So I kind of had already picked that up just from like being around luchadors. Um, so that made it a little bit easier. But then, like I said, once you get like accustomed to how they do their matches, you kind of start to understand like the structure of it so you understand like what kind of goes where and it makes it a little bit easier it took me it took me about like the full three months to realize like to kind of understand it but like once you kind of get it you're like okay i understand and it gets a lot easier it's just like with anything it's like the more you do it the easier you'll get okay so your first match was that tag team match anything surprise you at all it's like i wasn't expecting this kind of thing at all i wasn't expecting Things to be so fast paced at first. I wrestled like a singles match and I did it kind of like in the American style a little bit and they were like too slow. I was like, what? Like to me in my head, this is like a perfect pace. Like this is what like, what would be like expected of me in like America. But there they like it. Oh, like uh, a lot more fast paced wrestling. All right. So you do a couple of shows for Wave and you, you uh, I'm sorry, for, for Marvelous. Then you go on to Wave. How do you get... How do you get to different promotions when you're there for Marvelous? How do you end up on a Wave show? Some girls from Marvelous had already wrestled on Wave. And so over there, they kind of, they do, like, match negotiations. So, like, the promoter of each company will negotiate a match with another. So they'll be like, okay, I'll send you this person if you send me this person type of thing. Wave doesn't really bring in foreigners. 
So it was just kind of like an easy spot to put me in because, you know, they don't have any foreigners there for that company. So do you have somebody helping you backstage, kind of lead me around what's going on, or how does that work? Um, Again, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm sorry to ask about the day-to-day stuff, but that's the stuff that fascinates me the most. It's like it's the day-to-day and being a, a foreigner in a, in, a, in a foreign land, you know. When I was there, a lot, so a lot of the Marvelous girls were already booked on the Wave show, so I, it wasn't like I was by myself or anything. And um, Takumi and, like, uh, the, what we would call, like, the ace of the Marvelous, She's like the head girl, you know, mm-hmm. and she's a regular on on Wave. She's one of their top girls as well. So she kind of showed me the ropes. So she's like introducing me to a lot of people and told me like who each person was. And it was really good. So then you, you go to the Sendai uh, show as well. Is it kind of the same thing where they do like a talent trade kind of thing? Yeah. So I had met uh, Ketamora at a, at a Marvelous show. She was at the anniversary show. And she had watched my match, and she told me she liked my match, so she ended up booking me on uh, on Sunday Girls. And also, uh, Setamora is trained by Nagayo, too, so um, they have, like, a really good relationship, so that's why it was easy for me to go to Sunday Girls. But I actually worked at Sunday Girls a lot. Like, I probably did an equal amount of Marvelous in Sunday Girls shows. Teamed up and faced people like Asha Kong. What was it like to be in the ring with Asha Kong? It was really cool. She uh she's a sweetheart as well. And then I got to wrestle with uh Tatsumura. Tatsumura's English is pretty pretty good. So um it was really easy uh talking to her and kinda of like her explaining kinda of what she needed for me. And then also they've all like are very accustomed to working with foreigners. So they understand like what the American style is and so they know where I'm coming from when I'm putting a match together. So they'll They'll try to mesh the styles a little bit more to make it a little bit easier. So let me ask you about a few people you you were uh, in the ring with. Hikaru Shida, she's pretty amazing. Yeah, she's actually my tag partner in a match. And I seen, I'd seen her at Shimmer before. I'd seen her matches with uh, uh, Athena, who is now in Bermuda. So uh, I was really familiar with her work. So when I found out I got to tag with her, uh, it was pretty awesome. And you also tagged with Mesa Ruga from Gato Move. Yes, I did. She's a little spitfire. Yeah, she is. I saw that she was, like, at Pro Wrestling E recently. Yeah, she was there a couple weekends ago, I think, yeah. Yeah, she's very talented. Um, <laughs> and she's very, like, uh, she has a very cute style of the ring. It's really very entertaining. Uh, okay, yeah, so you all- that's good, dear. Yeah. Um, so you were in the ring with Manami uh, a little bit as well, a couple times. Yes. How how was she to face? It was a lot of fun. Like, I honestly, like, I was very, like, surprised with how understanding uh, and easy everybody was to work with. And they were very, like, they were very, very patient with me. And then it was uh, when I started to kind of, like, understand the style and how they put their magic together, I was able to put, like, input into the match more, make more suggestions. And then whenever I was putting more suggestions in, they would be, like, very impressed. They were like, oh, you're picking it up. Like, you're understanding, like, the style. Like, so they would be very appreciative of the fact that I was, like, paying attention and, like, contributing to the match. Um, so that was always good, too. You see your confidence was building the whole time you were, you were there as well. It was. It was slowly building. And then, you know, right when I feel like I'm starting to get it, it's like, oh, now I got to go back. <laughs> How did the fans uh, take to you? It was a lot of fun. So... There's this one fan, I don't know his name, but he, every time I would come out at Marvelous shows, he would scream my name. He'd go, hi on and he would say my name like that. And it would make me laugh every single time. And so I had a couple of fans in the United States that watched my matches in Japan, right? Mm-hmm. And so when I first came back to America and I did a couple of shows, uh, I came out and this one fan goes, hi on and he did it the exact same way that the Japanese fan did. And I looked at him like, what? Like, how do you know? And then afterwards he told me, he was like, oh, I watched your matches in Japan. And I always thought it was so funny when the guy would scream your name like that. <laughs> so it like legit followed me to America. <laughs> so how is the, because uh, I've gone to a few shows. I've gone to some wave shows and stardom shows, things like that. And merch and stuff like that after the shows is always crazy. What's the, what's the merch situation like after the shows for you? They are, they always want you to, like, uh, 
take a picture while you're holding your 8x10, or they have, like, this little blank. It's kind of like, I love to say it's card. The two board. shots, right? Like, yeah, where you, like, sign it. Yeah. Yeah, you always see those. But honestly, like, I would receive more gifts than anything. Fans would bring me, like, chocolate. I don't know. So, like, people found out that I really, really like chocolate. I guess the girls had, like, told people. Because um, it was, like, a running joke in the house. So I was like, oh, hey, I was going to eat all the chocolate, like, which I did. <laughs> so <laughs> fans would bring you a lot of chocolate. Jap- I'm hoping it's Japanese chocolate, right? Yeah, Japanese chocolate. It's so good. <laughs> well, everything there is good. I never, I honestly, the whole time I was there, I never ate anything that I didn't like. Did you go to 7-Eleven at all? Of course. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, okay. It's like, you had to go because, I mean, I'll eat 7-Eleven all day long there. Family Mart and Lawson. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, so in ring, what was your favorite part about Japan? I like the, the back and forth style. That was what I really liked about it. And I like, uh, I just like how, like, even though they don't do, like, a lot of crazy moves like you would see in America, just the moves that they do are so pretty. Like, the drop kicks are so beautiful. No one does a drop kick like the Japanese. Like, it's just amazing. What did you bring back in ring from Japan that you're using now that you didn't have before? I perfected my drop kick. <laughs> <laughs> And I learned how they, they bump differently. They do, like, some fundamental things differently than we do. So it's like I got to learn that style. I got to take that with me. And also, like, in training, they stress a lot, like, body control, like doing handstands and stuff like that, controlling your body while, you know, in the air. I know that's something that I came back with a lot, that I had a lot better body control. And I didn't even notice it until I came back. And people were like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that, you know? Who hits you the hardest over there? You like to throw forearms over there. Who hits you the hardest? That's kind of hard to think. Honestly, people think that the Japanese hit really hard, but they don't. It's the drop kicks that suck. They'll drop <laughs> kick the crap out of you. Who, who got you the best? This girl, uh, May from Marvelous. She drop kicks pretty hard. May Hoshizuki? But in a good way. Huh? May Hoshizuki? Yes. She got you good? She got me good, but I mean... There's some good draw kicks. I can't even be mad. Who, who, got, who did you get pretty good? You're like, oh, I, I got that one a little rough or a little, a little too stiff. I didn't realize that I was, well, not even that stiff, but we were doing, like, chain wrestling at, in training. And there, when they put a hold on you, it's very, like, loose. And not even to say that mine's stiff, but mine is just, like, a little bit more tight in the chain wrestling. And they were like, oh, loose it up. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't even realize that. Like, it was that much of a difference. This is how, like, I was just taught to do it, you know? Anything that you did to get to do in Japan in the ring that you wanted to do? I wa- So I wanted to hit my 450 in Japan, but the ropes are a lot lower in Japan than they are in America. Mm-hmm. So, and the guys and the girls have different rates. So the ropes sit a lot lower in uh, female rings, obviously. And, uh, like, when I stood up there, I was like, I don't even have time to, like, jump because it's so low. Compared to what I'm used to back home. Okay, so now that's in ring. Let's talk about outside the ring. What was your favorite thing about Japan outside of the ring? Like everything. The food is so good. And just like, I feel like Tokyo is like New York City on crap. Because like, you have Times Square, and it's just like that little part of New York is like that, you know? But in Tokyo, you have like big areas that are just like lit up like that all over the city and I think it's crazy it's so cool to see I want to go uh, back <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to you all right so okay talk about going back how realistic is that I mean did you did you make contacts there where you think someday you might be able to go back I would love to go back they asked me if I wanted to and I said yes uh it's really just like a matter of like timing uh, when I could go back uh, it probably wouldn't be till like next year though if I did go back where can we reach you on social media my Twitter handle is underscore the high on, so underscore T H E H Y A S. And on Instagram, it's just the high on. And I want to thank you for joining the show today and uh, appreciate your time and the best of luck in, in Chicago. Thank you so much.